Thank you for uh, this time being here in Israel and right now in Magdala. And uh, we ask that you would do great things as uh, we get to have Sunday service here. And may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so listen, everybody that's watching online, I am here in Israel. If you've been following us, then you know. And I'm here with a group of people. So um, it, this is great. In the place of Magdala is the place of Mary Magdalene. So we're going to be looking at this from Luke chapter 8. And I hope that you all at home are really blessed by this. I know that all of us are blessed, aren't we? Hasn't this been fantastic? And uh, so that was it. Now you know it's not fake. We really are here. And because so many people accuse me of using the green screen when I'm, in, when I'm in Jerusalem or wherever. I don't even know how to use a green screen. We haven't used one yet. But this is really cool. We've seen spectacular things. And also, have you felt safe? Yes. Okay. All of the warnings that you had, you realized, okay, we're... And what else is really neat, um, from what we understand, uh, what we've been told is we are the first tour group here that is not a solidarity group. I was here with the solidarity group in January. We're also in, uh, a group that is not subsidized, uh, whether it be by a corporation or by government or whatever. We're the first tour group coming as a tour group has uh, usually come to Israel. So this is really exciting. And if you've been here before to Magdala, then you can look behind me and see there's nobody here. It's just us. And, and everywhere we are going, we are like this. And uh, I hope that you are as blessed as possible watching this from home. And uh, we want to thank you for joining us for Sunday morning. So here in Luke chapter 8, beginning of verse 1, Luke writes, It came to pass afterward that Jesus went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. So the twelve obviously are the apostles, and where it says here, uh, went through preaching and teaching in every city and village, bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, uh, I believe it's specific to the areas around the Sea of Galilee, which would include Capernaum, where we were yesterday, uh, where we were earlier today, Chorazim, uh, Bethsaida, we got a little bit of a lesson on that too and the other places along this part of the Galilee. And as Bob had pointed out yesterday, he said, extend your hands. You go basically from Mount Arbel, which we're going to maybe get to in a little while, maybe tomorrow morning, between there and Capernaum was 70% of the ministry of Jesus that we read about. So we see him going through, preaching and teaching in the synagogues in this area. As certain women, verse 2, who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. Just three verses, but these three verses are loaded with some really, really uh, neat things. And again, we are, we're here in Magdala, Behind me is the synagogue that's here in Magdala. And we think of Jesus preaching and teaching in the cities, in the villages. Synagogue here, you wonder, was Jesus at this synagogue? By the way, there's been another synagogue that's been uncovered that's just across the main road here. Uh, also in the area of Migdal or, or Magdala. So, I mean, this is just remarkable. Every time I come here to this place, I get goosebumps, and I don't know if Ronnie's, if we're going to have time to go there afterwards, but there's a chapel downstairs, and you, oh, the, you're going to love it. There's a pillar that's there with women, but I'm not going to spoil that. I'm going to let Ronnie. I spoiled it, I spoiled it to him like, like. Okay. <laughs> But this is really cool. It is so cool, and it's really, the, what you're going to see is based upon the passage that we just read with these women. So let's start here. I, I have several main points. And I also have some takeaways for us, all right? So the first one is this. These main points come in the form of a question. Who was Mary Magdalene or Mary of Migdal? Um, and her name, last name wasn't Magdala or Magdalene. It's because she was from this area. It makes sense, right? Jesus of Nazareth and so forth. 
uh, Joseph of Arimathea. So who was she? Well, in Catholic tradition, I was raised Catholic. I was an altar boy. Um, I was telling Ronnie this, that the, uh, my, on my dad's side, which is Irish and German, on my dad's side, my cousin has traced back through written documents my ancestry for 500 years. And every single generation, not exaggerating, every single generation had at least one Catholic priest in it. And we were over at my brother's house a few years back, and he was there visiting, and he came up to me and he said, you broke it, You because I became a Protestant pastor, and all these Catholic priests were in the, in the lineage. But in the Catholic tradition, you have uh, certain things about Mary Magdalene. One of them is that she was a prostitute. The Bible doesn't say that, but the Bible does give us other specifics. Then there was the Da Vinci Code, uh, and you have these other things that say Mary Magdalene was married to Jesus. Jesus never died. You have the Gospel of Thomas and these fake writings. Well, we're going to get what the real facts are on this Mary. What does the Bible say about her? Well, we know that she's from this area, uh, Migdal or Magdalene. We also know from what we just read that she was possessed by seven demons. That is remarkable. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how Jesus cast the demons out of her, like the place of Corsi or Gadarenes, where we know that uh, Jesus has this conversation, who are you? Legion, for we are many. And he casts the demons into the pigs, the pigs go into the sea. We don't have that with Mary, but we do know that the Bible tells us that she has seven demons. And I'm going to tell you this, one demon is a lot. To have seven is an awful lot. So we'll get a little bit more into that in a few more minutes. But uh, So number one, who was Mary Magdalene? Number two, who are these other women that are listed here? So all of these women, including Mary Magdalene, are seen at the cross and at the empty tomb and the resurrection of uh, Jesus. There's also, we have here, we have the wife of the chief steward of Herod. Uh, it it's, uh, tells us here, Let's see, let me find where it is. Joanna, the wife of Husa, the chief steward of Herod. I want you to think of that. For those of you who are from California, for example, you think of somebody in the administration of Governor Newsom. You say there's no possible way anybody in Newsom's administration could possibly be a follower of Jesus. I mean, you, and you start looking at things, a wife of the chief steward. So he wasn't just a guy that worked for Herod. He's the chief steward of Herod, and his wife becomes a follower of Jesus. You're looking, I bet that was an interesting conversation. I just met this man today, Jesus, and I'm going to start following him all over the country. And here he is, the chief steward of Herod. To me, that is just really encouraging when you start thinking of people in politics. You start thinking of people who, who have a position maybe in Silicon Valley. I have a friend, Pastor Mike uh, McClure from uh, Silicon Valley, where Calvary Chapel San Jose, his church, as I think he said, there's 2,000 adults that are uh, at his church, and almost all of them work for Google or Facebook or something like that. And people think there's no way anybody at Facebook could possibly be saved. You find out there's a church of 2,000 people up there that are on fire for the Lord that pushed back against all the nonsense of the last four years. So this is just a reminder of the neat things that God does that we don't know. And I think just seeing that little bit there with Joanna, the wife of the chief steward of Herod, you go, wow. That is so cool. God has people in all kinds of positions that uh, become followers of his. So we see these women at the cross. Mark chapter 15, verses 40 and 41 say, There were also women looking from afar. This is when Jesus is crucified. And by the way, we're coming up uh, next week as traditionally known as Palm Sunday. Hey, by the way, everybody watching this online. So with uh, Palm Sunday, I'm, we're hoping to be able to film somewhere near the Palm Sunday Road or something. We'll see how that turns out. And then Resurrection Sunday, Easter, maybe by the Garden Tomb. 
if we can work out a deal to be able to do something like that. But uh, we'll see. But I, I think if that's coming and we see these women here, where are they? They're at the cross. So Mark chapter 15 says there were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less, and of Joseph and Solomon. Salome, excuse me who also followed Jesus and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. I, I look at this and I think, uh, this, is, this is really cool. It's these women who are ministering to him. And anybody who studies uh, psychology or the movement of people, uh, generation to generation, you find out that women tend to be more sensitive to spiritual things than men. And here we have these women who are there. Remember, you, you know the story about what happened at the cross. The followers of Jesus. Yesterday we talked about Peter. What's he do? I'll, I'll die with you, Lord. Well, he was one of the first to scatter and start denying the Lord. Uh, but you see, the women were at the cross. Very interesting. Now, they were from afar. The Bible doesn't tell us why, but they were, they were at a distance. They, could st they, were, they were still there. They didn't run away like the men did. But maybe it was because emotions overwhelmed them. Uh, maybe some other reason. Maybe they were a little bit afraid, which would make sense, but they were still there. They're at the cross. They're at the empty tomb. John chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, here she is again, went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Uh, when Mary Magdalene and the other women came to the tomb, seeing that the stone had been rolled away, they assumed that somebody had taken his body out. Um, that's one thing that had happened. But the other thing that's interesting about this is the stone wasn't rolled away, we know this, right, to let Jesus out. The stone was rolled away to let people in and see, he is not here, for he has risen. It was also these very, it was the same women. Um, just a few verses later in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 11 through 16, goes on and says, But Mary Magdalene stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. There's the assumption. They've stolen his body. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Um, I look at this and think, that must have been really something. I can't wait to get to heaven and meet Mary who was from this place. And, and what was it like when you're there thinking his body has been stolen and you're thinking you're talking to the gardener and next thing you find out, it's him. Wow. So cool. So cool. The third question. Why did Jesus appear to her first? We don't know for sure, but we can make some guesses. Uh, he had to appear to someone first. We would all agree with that, right? He had to pick somebody. Just like I would say in my family, I used to ask, why did God save me? I have uh, seven brothers and sisters. One of my sisters is here, uh, the annoying one. But um, <laughs> do, do, I, do I say that out loud? <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I used to ask, why, am, why did God save me out of the family? Well, God has to start with somebody in the family. Yeah. So he starts with somebody first. And then from there, it's other people. Why, why did he go to Mary Magdalene first? He, he had to appear to somebody first. In the case of Mary Magdalene, I think it was because of the compassion of Jesus 
that moved him toward her more than anyone else to go to her first. In, in, I'm going to give you an example. In Luke's gospel, in fact, this is where one of the Catholic traditions comes in. The Bible says where Jesus is speaking, uh, he, he, he forgives the woman who was a prostitute. And some people connect these two together. I don't think it's Mary Magdalene, but that's Catholic tradition. Maybe it is, right? That doesn't really matter. But what happened in Luke chapter 7, Jesus forgives the woman that was a prostitute, and he says this, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. This Mary, from this place, I mean, I mean you look around and you go, this is really, it's just, it, it does give me goosebumps just coming to these places and thinking, this is real. And there's people that say this isn't real. You know, it's just amazing, just amazing. But she is possessed by seven demons. No doubt her sins were great. Uh, I would add to this that being possessed by seven demons, no doubt she would have been an outcast. Uh, again, being possessed by one demon would be very problematic. But being possessed by seven demons, uh, I'm guessing nobody's going to want to hang around with her. You look at her, she, she's one of the street people. She's got crazy hair, yelling at people. I mean, if you start working it out, what kind of woman was she? Was she the palm reader? Was she the crazy person on the corner yelling at cars as they go by? Um, what, what, whatever it was, the, the men at Gadarenes, they had to be chained up and they would break the chains they were out in the cemetery. They couldn't be around the people. So you start looking at this and going, something would have been seriously wrong. Possibly a prostitute, too. You know, possibly. But I'm thinking the other women wouldn't have received her. Joanna, the wife of Chuza, the other Marys, the ones she's hanging around. I mean, listen, you know how it is. You have a Bible study, Right? I mean, none of you do this because you're holy, but let's just say, but uh, maybe you're home watching, you have a Bible study, the new person walks in, let's keep an eye on them, right? I, I know how churches work. Well, you should hear their story. I, I knew, I, listen, I, I know about their past. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God, because we all have a past. And we are saved because of our past. You know what qualifies us for salvation? Our sins. <laughs> That's what qualifies us. Because we are sinners, we get to be saved. I imagine that they would have kept her at a distance even once she becomes this follower of Jesus after Jesus cast the demons out thinking, it's fake, it didn't really happen. I saw her over in the corner still talking like this. I was there. I, no, I saw the whole thing, really. <laughs> we don't know for certain what happened. We don't know for certain how he cast out the demons, but we know he did it, and we know he had great compassion on her, and um, he delivered her, saved her, and forgave her. And Jesus for whatever reason, appears to Mary first, and I believe is simply because he's a man of compassion. Just like, as we saw when we were at Tabga yesterday, um, Peter, he singles out Peter, uh, other than all of the other apostles, there on the shores of Tabga, and says, Peter, let's talk. I'm sure Peter's thinking, uh-oh, now I'm really in trouble. <laughs> Instead of really being in trouble, the Lord restores him, draws him in, pulls him back, says, Peter, you rock. You went through this, but I love you too much. I am not going to leave you in that place. And, and he went, it was compassion towards Peter, compassion that moved him in a way like this towards Mary of this place, Migdal. Number four, why does Jesus save people like this? Well, let me go to another passage. Gospel of John, chapter 9. Might be going there in the next couple of days too, to this place. 
I'm not sure exactly what's going on with the schedule because I can't remember, but I think you're going to the pool of Siloam Shiloach. And uh, so it's John chapter 9, right? This is so cool. John chapter 9, verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked Jesus, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seen. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is this, is not this the one who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. He said, I am he. I love that. It is him. I don't know if it's him. I am him. Trust me. I know who I am. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes open? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and received sight. And then they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. I, I, I love how this whole thing goes on from here. Um, in fact, I'm, do I have enough time to read a little bit more? Okay, good. I hope you're okay at home too, because I'm just going to, it's such a cool passage. Uh, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees, and it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight and said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among the Pharisees. And they said to the, the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been born blind and received the sight until they called the parents of him who had received the sight. This just gets better and better. And they asked them, saying, is this your son, who, who, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered and said, we don't know that, that this is our son, that he was born blind. But what, by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. You ask him. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed uh, that if anyone confessed that he is the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Can, can I go a little bit longer? Okay. Because the way I'm going, I might not stop. Okay, what, what, where was, oh. So they, they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner, speaking to Jesus. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know uh, is that I was blind and now I see. Now it goes on from here and then the disciples ask Jesus. They say, well, was he uh, blind because of his own sin? I mean, the guy's just born, right? I mean, what did he do? He was born blind. He must have been a real bad sinner in the, in the womb. I mean, you, when you look at this and you look at the reasoning, it's just kind of interesting. Is, it, is he blind because of his own sin or because of the sin of his parents? right? It's like neither, but that God would be glorified. This is it. He was born blind so that God would be glorified. Imagine he was born in that state and he had suffering through his life because of it. But Jesus had a plan. He was going to meet him one day because it was going to reveal who Jesus is. It was these miracles that were going to reveal Jesus as the Messiah. Listen, again, it's a reminder for you and I, we go through our challenges, we go through our sufferings, we have the different problems that we have, loved ones pass away, really difficult things, but ultimately, God wants to be glorified in our life, whatever it is. And he gets the glory. In fact, the worse the sinner 
the more glory God gets. Because people look and say, there's no way this person could possibly be saved. I know them. I, I told this story recently, so stop me if I told it to you guys, because I can't remember, because I'm always talking somewhere about something. <laughs> so, um, did, okay, let me ask you this. Did I tell you recently about a friend of mine from high school who died from AIDS? Okay, good. Then I can tell the story now. Okay, okay. So we were good friends in high school. His name was Brad. And um, we got separated from high school. Uh, we both were, had kind of messed up. Um, we just did messed up stuff. I, neither of us could blame our families for doing messed up stuff. We both were raised in pretty good homes, right? But we both made really bad choices. Uh, drugs involved in both of them. But we lost contact with each other. And... Uh, years later, I get saved, and, um, and I had these two friends of mine. Uh, one was a pastor, another was an elder at the church in Riverside, where I en uh, ended up being a pastor at. And uh, they said, hey, can your friend Brad from high school? I said, yeah. And he said, uh, he, he really wants to see you. I said, how do you guys know him? He said, well, we got a call to go to the house where he lives, and pray for him. And I said, really? So what's going on? He's dying from AIDS. And he's only given a couple of weeks to live. So uh, anyways, I went and saw him. And he, uh, he, it was, I didn't know about this alternate lifestyle that he had. That part I didn't know about. But my friends also, in the meantime, they had visited him several times. And Brad, in that couple of weeks, he ended up giving his life to the Lord. So uh, a week later, after he passes away, um, the family asked me to do the memorial service for Brad. So at the memorial service was, it was some friends of mine from high school, plus parents of friends of mine. And I remember doing the memorial service, and one of my friend's moms came up to me. I'm, I'm wearing a black suit. I got a big black Bible, and she comes up to me at the end of the memorial service, and she just looks at me, and she goes, Tommy Hughes? Tom, that can't be. It's impossible, because in her mind, there's no way you can be saved and then preaching. It cannot happen, and her mind just couldn't connect. But here's the fact. God saves unlikely people, and he does remarkable things. And you look, you think, praise God. The apostle Paul was Saul the hater, right? The persecutor. The woman caught in adultery. And this Mary of Migdal, of this very place that we are. Last question, number five. What is this group of women not famous for? They're not famous for the very thing that they did. It tells us in verse 3 of Luke chapter 8, this group of women provided for Jesus from their substance. Nobody, most people just assume they're with these 12, Jesus is with these 12 guys walking all over the countryside and the, the guys go out collect the money or something. Judas has the money bag. We, we know that, right? Well, it's this group of women that a group of women, including Mary of Magdala, Joanna, and so forth, that were, it was a group of them. It wasn't just the 12 guys. And, but we don't think that. And, and, I, and I love this because they, it's just, okay, this is what we have. This is what's in the bank account. And for Joanna, listen, her husband, who's the chief steward of Herod, had to agree. You can take some of what we got and give it to the ministry of Jesus. That is crazy when you start, if you start working this out in real life. Generation to generation, people are the same. They have the same kinds of problems. They have the same kinds of husbands and the same kinds of wives at home. Same thing, right? People don't change. Cultures change. Um, we have technology changes and that, but people are people. And these are real people who would have worked with real situations and nobody really knows about these women and what they did. But this is really a remarkable thing. And again, it, it speaks to what you'll see downstairs when 
you go down there in just a few more minutes. Uh, let me give just a few takeaways, all right? These really will be fairly short, uh, fair, fair, fairly. <laughs> Number one, as a Christ follower, when we serve others, we become God's partners. Jesus said elsewhere, whatsoever you do to the least of these, my brothers, that you do to me, right? It doesn't matter what it is. Visiting someone in prison, um, a cup of cold water, whatever it is. Jesus was saying that in the context of, listen to this, ministering to the Jews during their time of persecution, by the way, which is very interesting. As you and I are here in the Holy Land, there's, I mean, look around. We've, We've been the only group from place to place to place we've gone. But we are seeing um, the evacuees from the places up north that are staying in the hotels with us. We're meeting other people. They're so thankful that we are just there. And, um, and, And so much of Israel and the Jews are forgotten. But much worse than that, is I'm watching, we're all watching it, the anti-Semitism. Craig had to shut off comments from one of the videos where we were worshiping at Caesarea the other day because of anti-Semitism. I mean, we weren't even talking about Israel there. But the anti-Semitism was so bad, over 500 comments, only 20 were positive. And you look at that and you think, this is what's happening. So if you want to put this into the context for you and I, you're here, and for people at home, it's understanding the context of those words were ministering to the Jews during their time of persecution. And, and what the Bible also tells us uh, in the, um, uh, the, the 70th week of Daniel, but it's understanding day to day also ministering to those who are near you. Being the hands and feet of Jesus would probably be another way of saying it. Number two, great things can be accomplished through you if you don't care when someone else gets the credit. You ever think of that? These women got, really got no credit. Um, we hear about all the things the apostles did. We hear of so many, other, so many other things you hear. These women, God did great things for. Imagine you being a person who walked with Jesus and provided for him that he could do the work. Do you realize how great that is? When you start looking at, at in the great picture of the kingdom of God in heaven and the salvation of people, and we are, do you, do you, if you really put into it, we are here today also because this, this group of women went out of their way, talked with their husbands or whatever, worked in that, worked the job, whatever it was, you know, to come alongside and provide for the furtherance of the gospel, and they didn't have the understanding of the gospel that we do. That is remarkable. But they didn't care if they got the credit. So, so often, I'm, I mean, I know I'm tempted, but why, why do they get all the fame? I don't get much. You know, the, this, this, what is that? It's like, it's like Peter yesterday arguing with Jesus when Jesus says, Peter, you're going to die. Well, what about John? That's not your problem, right? Don't worry if somebody else gets the credit. Jeremiah 45, verse 5. Do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. Matthew chapter 6. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will, reward, will himself reward you openly. That was one of the passages Pastor Bob would have gotten to a couple hours ago or an hour ago at Beatitudes if I didn't shorten them down. Don't worry about it. Let God get the glory. You get your reward in heaven. Number three, don't write off someone as being unredeemable. So easy to do that. It's impossible. Just you, you, you kind of take this category of people, put them aside, and you see people are dressed better, a little bit nicer. You go out of your way. Let me tell them about Jesus because they're so nice. <laughs> and and uh, we, we tend to write off the people who... Um, maybe they got the drug problem or, they, or, or whatever. Think of it that we don't know the problems people go through also. Uh, you start looking at people through their hard life. I look at the streets sometimes and I think how many people I see on the streets were part of the foster care system in the United States, which when you're 18, you're kicked out. And if you were a foster kid that you had no genuine love or care ever for those 18 years, man, what a... What, 
trying to overcome that. And then you think of Mary of Migdal. What was she? What kind of home life did she have? You know, you work these things out. Don't write off someone as being unredeemable. Last, Jesus saves souls and changes lives. That's what he does. And that's why we're here. Because Jesus does these remarkable things. He saves souls and he changes lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, Listen, thank you everybody for joining us online. But right now I'm going to ask you to pray with us to just join us. We're right here in Israel. And uh, let's all pray together. Lord, we thank you for this incredible opportunity to be here in the Holy Land. Help us to give you the glory. May the name of Jesus be lifted above all other names. And in this time, as we learn these things, just from these three short verses with the life of Mary of Migdal, Mary Magdalene. Lord, may we remember these things, apply these lessons to our lives. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, everybody watching online, don't forget again, Palm Sunday from Jerusalem next Sunday morning, and then also the Sunday after, Resurrection Sunday, hopefully from the Garden Tomb. And then join us tonight. Uh, There's something really cool that is going to happen online tonight. It's a special for you all. Uh, Premier, it's going to be a super blessing to you while we are here in the Holy Land. God bless you, everybody online. And you guys all ready? Want to say goodbye to them? Bye. Bye.